to the StatMed Podcast, where we teach you how to study in med school and how to pass board style exams. Your host is Ryan Orwig, a learning specialist with more than a decade of experience working with med students and physicians. This episode is the second of three in which Ryan sits down with Dr. Jim Colhane from Notre Dame of Maryland University School of Pharmacy. They discuss ways to set up a study group for success and dig into the different roles students can take on in these groups. I think that it's really important that the at the end of every study group that the members reflect on, okay, what do I know and what do I don't know? We've talked about this already, right? Identifying what do I really know, what am I familiar with, and I think that I know, and what do I really not know? And then yeah. use that information to strategically drive your studying after you get outside of the study group, right? Well, so, oh, oh, that, that's, that's, that's amazing. That's, that's amazing, yeah. I think. Right. What can be done solution wise, setup wise to really make the most out of study groups? Because And look, some people are required to be in study groups. Some people just really want to be in study groups because they want to be around other people um, and, 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 and anywhere in between. Right. Maybe yep. I, I think and this is something I think I could see the two of us doing at some point is building uh, a, like a course, like a, like a, like a, like a, like a course where. It's like, this is what you do to set up your study group, right? Yes. But yes. You, you've got a lot of thoughts on this. I've got some like broad thoughts, but everything for me li- largely sort of falls into take the stat med class, learn all those skills, learn to study autonomously. And then if you want to bring that into a study group, by all means, do it. Mm-hmm. But I think you've got a little more, uh, I don't know, thought out, discreet thoughts on this. Um, so what can you tell us about some some of your your thoughts on the setup of a study group and solutions to maximize study groups. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, and I, and again, I think, you know, my, my, the, the thought that I put into this and the approach uh, again, just is uh, due to the, the environment that I'm in as a faculty member and as an academic coach. Right. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get students together that have a similar skill set so that they can use and take advantage of that when they're learning. I mean, the scenario that you you just described where you have a student, let's say that has gone through the stat med class, you know, right. has got frameworking down and all the other great things that you teach them. And then they go yeah. back to their study group and they try to they try to pass that information along or convince other people that this is the way that they should learn. And that falls, it falls flat. And then they're, could, then yeah, they're stuck true. again. Right. Yeah. So I could. think if you're, if you're going to join a study group, I think it's really important that everybody's on the same sheet of music and, and has a similar, you know, similar skill set and understands what they need to do. So when Hold I think, about, so, so, yeah, well, let me, let me just interject yeah. real quickly here. Yeah, so so that's certainly true from a stat med class student going back in, but 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 I think largely th- what you're what you're setting up here is true for any for pretty much anybody, right? Yep, anybody. Absolutely. So if you're a med student, you're a pharmacy student, you're in some other medical professional program, and you want to be in a study group. Yep. This this these these recommendations are fantastic. I mean, and again, absolutely. when you were laying these out to me, I was like, ah, oh, so obvious, right? But it's not. Because so many people don't do this. And this is it's like it's like a great invention, you know? Like everybody will say the cliche is like, oh, I should have invented the post-it note. You should have. Should have. Uh, mil- <laughs> millions did. and millions of people did not. Right. And it's just the, the hallmark of a good invention is ah, so obvious. So obvious. And I think so and that's what this is. But it's but it's about being deliberate, it's about being explicit, and it's about setting it up at the beginning. Because it's really yes. hard to change group dynamics once the the train has left the station. So give us give us some of your thoughts on this. Yeah. So okay. Great. So I have I have two real inspirations uh, for you know what we're going to be talking about. Um, the the first inspiration comes from a lot of the cooperative learning literature um, in, in the in the educational research uh, that talks about uh, group dynamics and and things like team based learning. Uh, where different members of the group, so those your medical students that are listening out there that are at a, a team-based learning uh, institution, you are already light years ahead of maybe some of the other folks that aren't because you recognize that in any particular group that you're learning in, whether it's in a classroom setting where you're in team-based learning or whether you're studying outside of class, um, that there different members of the group should have different roles and responsibilities. Um, there should be, again, key uh, 
uh, goals that are set by the by the group members and um, clearly delineated responsibilities that everybody has to uh, you know uh, uh, buy into. Uh, mm-hmm. The other the other real inspiration um, comes from the uh, sort of the uh, business. Uh, literature. Um, the the blog posts that I've I've written for you that I, I think you'll have up on your on your website um, in the in the near future. Um, I, I reference a, a New York Times article uh, that was written by a, a regular contributor to that, Adam Bryant, and the title of the article is "How to Run a More Effective Meeting." Because as I think about study groups, uh, they're a lot like. Uh, committee meetings that I'm involved in a lot as a faculty member. So, uh, you know, uh, I've been in really effective functional committee meetings. And unfortunately, uh, I've been in a lot of committee meetings that aren't well run and are a waste of time. So uh, I, I think those, uh, that's really important. Oh, yeah. I, and I what I have found over the years is that as I was building the time management and time management sections and, and building out the tools that we teach in the class, um, it's, it was from reading about like business and entrepreneurship. That's where the best tools yes. come from for flipping this over for the, for the, for the, you know, the med student learner. I think that these students have got to learn to run their lives like entrepreneurs. Your yes. business is getting through the program and all the sort of, because entrepreneurship is obsessed with efficiency See, and productivity, right? Productivity, right. Workflow generation. And, and I think like the, the, one of the big things where people fall off is they're sort of carrying an office drone mentality, like punch the time clock. Like I don't like people will call me and they're like, I don't get it. I'm studying 10 hours a day. Why am I failing? I'm like, I, <laughs> where do I you begin? Know. I don't know. I don't know. Like that tells me nothing. Right. Uh, other than telling me like, you think just by punching, punching the time clock, you're going to make the money. But as a business owner, you know, like it doesn't matter how many hours I work. It matters what I'm doing with it and, and then where my efficiencies are. So, so yeah, you sort of have this inspiration from the cooperative learning literature and this this sort of business oriented uh, article about you know running a more effective meeting. We'll we'll put those in the show notes so that you guys can link to those articles as well. So yeah. where does that take you? Um, sort of thinking about sure. this, like like setting up a, a good study group. Yeah. So uh, in, you know, in the article, Brian talks about um, he you know the article and the and he's got five ba- he's got five basic principles, uh, at least five that I cited. Um, that uh, have come from his conversations with over like 500 major uh, chief executive officers from major corporations. And um, so these, uh, the, the first recommendation that he has that I think works really, really well for study groups is to set a regular agenda. Okay. So, yeah. and it, you know, a, a meeting agenda or a study group agenda, what it does for you is it it provides you with a real clear purpose for what the meeting is about okay it's a it, it, brian puts it in his article it's a it's a clear compass for conversation so it's going to tell you things like when and where your meeting is going to take place so everybody's on the same sheet of music about that uh, yeah. you know from a study group standpoint on your agenda what subjects or subjects are going to be covered um during that meeting time so what are you guys going to do what are you going to be talking about how long yeah. will you spend on each of those subjects? It's really easy to go down a rabbit hole with a subject and you only intended spending 45 minutes on it. But, you know, three hours later, you're still talking about the same concept and you haven't moved on. So, you know, yeah. setting a time frame for that. Um, what's the responsibility that each of the group members has for in that particular meeting? So, you know, maybe, yeah. you know, maybe something as simple as, hey, you're going to bring the snacks to this study, this study group meeting or, yeah. you know, um, or, you know, person B, you've got to read chapter 20 in the textbook and maybe generate some retrieval practice questions that you can quiz the group with. You know, there's a whole whole slew of things that we can do. But I think, you know, what is your responsibility as a group member? And then ultimately listing down what types of learning strategies are you going to use Right. During the study group meeting. So and, and and putting an agenda together is not something that should take 45 minutes. Right. No, um, it no. really is something, especially once your study group gets rolling. This could be something that takes, you know, five or 10 minutes for someone to put together and disseminate to the group before the meeting so that everybody yep. knows what you know the expectations are. But um, it's hugely important. And I think that 
One of the major things that you can get out of setting an agenda is that it can help you to avoid that illusion of productivity that you and I talked about, mm-hmm. right? Is that yeah. if you have a clear list of objectives and things that you want to get through with, with you know, you, if you're using that SMART goal um, format, S-M-A-R-T is an acronym stands for specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. If you're using that format to set the goals for your study meeting, at the okay. end, you can go back and check and see, did I accomplish A, B, and C? Because those goals are very specific. You can measure yep. whether you attain them or not. Hopefully, they're attainable in the time frame that you have decided to meet in. They're relevant for everybody and that you've sent a specific time um, period that you want to accomplish that goal in. So, no, I, th- I think it's great. I think it's great. And, and I think it's all about setting this up at the beginning. Yes, absolutely. Once uh, groups are like organisms, they have their own like heartbeat and life and, and, and directionality almost, right? Um, when we used to, so David and I, my, my partner with StatMed, when we start, we, we met running an adventure camp in Baltimore. It was an educational adventure oh, wow. camp for dyslexic kids with ADHD. It was residential. Okay. So we, David, and I lived with these kids for six, six weeks, like residential, wow. 24 hours a day. So in the morning, it was all like like intense academic learning, Orton Gillingham stuff to rehabilitate the dyslexia. But then the rest of the time was just running around like crazy with these kids and just just wearing them out and and making it like the sugar to go with the 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 you know the the remediation stuff. And you know you bring these counselors in, these college kids, and what we would talk about is like your 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 control over the group is only as tight as it is on the first day when you meet yes. them. This first few days, it's the same for classroom teachers, for coaches, whatever you want it to be. So you set that lasso tight and it's only going to get looser as you go. So, you yeah. know, you have you have the counselor coming in like, hey, I'm your buddy. Like, oh, no, they're going to no. eat him alive. Like Lord of the Flies. And you'd watch <laughs> it every year. We did this for like six, six seven years. Like Lord of the Flies, those kids were just just savage, that that poor counselor. And then the counselor is eventually going to get mad and be sad right. and miserable. And they don't understand like that, you you know, you set guy. I, I was always just a believer. Make the rules external and explicit. Be consistent. Uh, and, and kids will respect that. Um, and, and, and then then you can loosen it up later on. You can always loosen it, but you can't make it tighter. It's so much harder. So yeah, once, once the cows, cows get out of the barn or the horses get out of the barn, right? It's hard to get them back in. So, yeah, I can't imagine. Right. So so when you when you come into the idea of the study group. The idea should be let's set some ground rules from ground the rules. beginning. Yes. Let's build some goals and expectation. And, and I think being explicit and external with this is really important. Like, And, and that just means writing it out. This is what we're yep. going to do. This is what we're going to agree to. And then if everybody agrees to it, like it makes it a lot harder to buck the system and, and, and go rogue. Yeah, you know, and I think the other thing too, Ryan, is that I think it's really important for people that are joining a study group or forming a study group that they're really honest with themselves and with one another about what their goals and objectives are, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, because some some people are looking for that emotional support group. Some people yeah. are looking for, you know, a social group to join. Some people, yeah. you know, are just, hey, uh, as long as I can pass this class, I don't care. Uh, that's that's my right. primary objective. And then you've got the yeah. you've got the gunners that are they want the A, you know, no matter what. Yeah. And and so right. if you're not all if you all don't have a sh- at least one shared reason why you're there, um, that can really lead to a lot of discord, I think, amongst group members. And I like your idea well, about setting the, the stage first. Right. Here's set, that, the way things are going to be. That's yeah. real. That that's something that translates. And. I bet a lot of people in this situation would say, I don't even know what I want. Right. Like, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I want an outcome. I want to get right. fit. Well, what, I'm, so I'm going to go to the gym. But but what are you going to do at the gym? I don't know yet. Like, and that's OK. That's, that's not wrong. But we if you want to optimize. Right. You want to optimize the experience. And again, once med school starts, once the Farby semester starts, there's not a lot. I mean, you, you don't have a, a month to figure it out. So I think asking it of yourself and the group is it can be a healthy thing it can be a yes. healthy thing to say like let's 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 ask that question 
Let's see what that is. Let's see what it, and then we can sort of shape it. Okay. Yeah. And so, there's not a right or wrong answer here either. I mean, I think that not, it, at it, not at all. I mean, I think that it's just really important for you to be honest with yourself and with yeah. your fellow group members so that everybody's, you know, uh, understands where they're coming from. Absolutely. No, I think, I think it's really important stuff. What else? So what else? So that was sort of talking about managing. Was that right? Were you sort of yeah, talking about managing, managing the group? You know, and the agenda does one other thing, I think. Well, it does a lot of things, but there's one other thing that I wanted to mention here, too. It really helps to facilitate the use of an evidence-based learning strategy called interleaving. And this is a, mm. this is a strategy you and I have talked uh, quite a bit about in the past. Um, so yeah. in study groups, one of the one of the temptations I've seen in, with my students is that study groups, when they get together, they only want to focus on one particular subject. And usually mm. the subject they're focusing on is the one that they have an exam in in two or three days. Right. That's when they're getting together to test themselves and 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 and, and go through the material. Interleaving yeah. is a strategy where just so your listeners are familiar with this is a strategy where, let's say during a study session, you can do this independently or with a group, that instead of studying yeah. only one subject, you interweave or intermix a different but related subject material together. So for example, um, instead of studying anatomy and physiology in a study group for four hours, uh, I would recommend, okay, when you set your agenda, let's spend you know an hour and a half on A and P an hour and a half on biochemistry, and maybe an hour on histology or some other biologically related uh, you know, biomedical discipline. And when you interleave, mm -hmm. the reason why that's so powerful is it introduces what um, researchers call a desirable difficulty into your learning. It makes your learning more difficult, but not impossible. And that desirable difficulty is really, really important. And where that comes from is, is having to shift gears from one topic to a different topic over a short period of time. So you're, you guys are all intensely focused on, let's say, A and P, and then all of a sudden that time's up and you've got to shift to biochemistry. Now your brain's got to shift gears. Okay. Yep. And, you know, students don't understand, well, why would I want to make it difficult for myself <laughs> when I'm studying? Why do I want to introduce this, quote unquote, desirable difficulty and why is it desirable? Well, the right. analogy I always use with them to explain is, let's say I love your gym analogy, right? If you're going to the gym and you're working out and you sit down on a machine and you start doing reps on the machine with no weight on it, right? Yeah. Are you working out? Well, yeah, technically. Is it easy? Ah, absolutely. Are you getting yeah. any benefit out of it? No way. Right. No. So you've got to put some weight on that machine and you've got to make it difficult, but not impossible to finish those reps. And learning is very similar to that. So um, interleaving is a hugely powerful strategy that you can use in your study group if you set up your agenda right. A few things on that. Where to begin? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah my, 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 my gym and my favorite gym analogy is my buddy who worked out all through high school, sophomore, junior, senior year. In our yeah. senior year, we're all and I wasn't a big weight weight room person, but we're all hanging out in the weight room and somebody's talking about adding more weight to their bench press. Yeah. And my friend's face got a little like ashen. And he was like, Wait, you're supposed to add weight. Yeah. Right. He worked out for three years at the same weight the entire time. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> wow. Uh, okay. He's a he he's a physician now. Um, so uh <laughs> Love it. So the, uh, but yeah, the idea of like, like, or me, imagine like when I was lifting weights and nobody taught me how to do it, you start bench press, bench press. I get to, to rep 10 and it's like, Ooh, I'm starting to feel it. I'm done. Yeah. And then I'm not, and I'm, and I'm not pushing out those last five reps. Yes. That's where the actual, that's where you put muscle on, right? When yep. you're in that phase of near exhaustion, right? So likewise, this interleaving is training uh, our brains to understand, to switch. And when we then come back to the thing we switched off of, it's saying, hey, I, I, I'm going to need to, like, I'm not just learning this and putting it away and being done with it short term. When I, yep. when I study topic A and then B, C, and I come back to A later, either within that session or later, I'm training my brain to say, this is something that needs sustainability over the long term. And I'm cross training my ability to come back to it within that desire to, to, to uh, the, the, the desire difficulty right um, yeah what, what else and I think you know the other piece to that too that's really important is that um, you know when you interleave subject material you're not siloing it 
And you're yeah. actually forced to make connections between – and that's why I said – between the material you're studying. That's why I said yeah. when you interleave, you don't want to interleave radically different subjects. Like, okay, I'm going to study biochemistry and then you know medieval philosophy. OK, right. there's, there's probably very little connection between <laughs> two of those subject areas. Right. But if you're studying related but different subjects, it's it's really powerful to make connections between you, them. You will organically inherently make connections. You're shattering you the silos. Yes, yeah, you're you shattering you actively. Right, look so, for them when you're studying. so subconsciously and actively. Yep. Making those aha connections. Right. Absolutely. So great example. Yeah, great example of this. You might be studying, let's say, you know, cardiac output. And you're, let's say you're doing the cardiovascular section of your physiology course. You're studying cardiac output and you're learning how the this, you know, the autonomic nervous system regulates heart rate and force of contraction and things like that. And then in your biochemistry course, you're learning about adrenergic receptors and um, signal transduction. And if you're if you're studying those separately or learning those separately, you may not see the connection that, hey, right. wait a minute. There's adrenergic receptors that regulate heart rate and force of contraction and and all oh, these signal transduction pathways that I learned in biochemistry. Yeah, that's what's going on in the heart when, when the sympathetic nervous wow. system is activating beta receptors. And right there, boom, light bulb moment. And you'll remember that. But everything right everything's going to stick so much easier and be right. so much more retrievable and then other things are going to stick to that making the this, the learning around that more sticky it's absolutely it's and, and then another thing about this agenda is it's offsetting the locus of control this is getting out yes. this is more in, in group dynamic right yep. now the locus of control is not on like well you know like like Ryan wants to study this it's not about Ryan you know yep. it's about yes. the list the list goes off of the individual or the individuals, and it's about the agenda. I want yep. the any kind of agendas for, for independent learning and for individual learning and for group learning. If you can flip the agenda, the, the locus of control onto an agenda, it, it's going to run itself better. It's going to the, the, the experience is going to be that much tighter, right? Yep. Because it takes some of the emotion out of it, it takes some of the messiness out of it. And, and you know, obviously that's a skill that can be grown and, and you can get better at. It. And the idea is like, I wouldn't expect a group to run perfectly from the outset. You reflect, you adjust, you reflect, you adjust. And, you know, after a few sessions, you're really, you're really cooking with this stuff. What, what else can we say yeah. about setups and solutions to groups? Sure. So the second, the second major um, recommendation from Bryant is set starting and ending times to your meeting and stick to them. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, I, as you as you said before, uh, you know, one of the most valuable commodities that students have their currency is their time. Right. Yep. And Absolutely. it's really important for group members to be very respectful of one another's time. So if you set a specific start time for your study group and an end time, you should stick to that because, frankly, you know, members, different members of the study group may have planned something before the study group or after yeah. the study group. And you want to be respectful of that. I, is it OK to go um, over the agreed on ending time. Well, if everybody agrees that, hey, we're being real productive, we haven't gotten through everything that we need to, and yes, we're all, all okay to continue forward, I say, great, go for it. Um, but you want to have that, that that group consensus. And so uh, I think that that's really important. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and that's, again, that, that's just an entrepreneurial mindset. Think yep. of treat each other professionally and think about what the is it just because you want more time or one of the people wants more time? Think about it as, as growing the organism as a whole. What else? What else do you have? Yeah, oh, I love you know, I love that. There's a book there on you know, entrepreneuring your way through medical school, I think is a great book. You should write that, Ryan. <laughs> Put it on I love the list. It. <laughs> so I'm, I'm add, add it to the list, right? Yeah. All um, right. So so number three, end with action in mind. So that's this is another one. So when you get done with the meeting, right, what are you going to take away from that meeting and what are you going to do with that information? So um, I think that it's really important that the at the end of every study group that the members reflect on, OK, what do I know and what do I don't know? We've talked about this already. Right. Identifying mm -hmm. What do I really know? What am I familiar with? And I think that I know. And what do I really not know? And then yeah. use that information to strategically drive your studying after you get outside of the study group. Right. Well, so oh, uh, that, that's 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 amazing. That's that's amazing, yeah. I think. Right. And what I would say is, how what do I do with that as I'm coming to those things? 
I want to do it. As, I, I guess I want to do that analysis ideally as soon as possible at the either maybe at the end of the group or right afterwards. Right and after I want to write. I want and I want to write it down. Yeah. I do not want to trust my head to hold that stuff in place. You're already your your processor is already running hot. Offload as much stuff as possible. Keep a dedicated document where you are offloading this stuff, and you know it's going to be there. And you can then check that, and then that can springboard you transitioning out of group study into independent study. Absolutely, I love that. Yeah, I think and I think powerful. you know, and and even to even another idea too. Instead of even waiting until at the end of the meeting or after the meeting, during the meeting, you know, you should be offloading constantly. Off, yeah, constantly offloading. You know, you can do things like writing down concepts on a separate piece of paper that you know and you don't know, color coding your notes or your framework, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, with different colors, you know, red meaning maybe you don't know something, green, you're good yeah. to go, yeah. yellow, you've got familiarity, but you don't know. But some yeah. way of tracking that so that, like you said, you can be very strategic um, with your studying outside of the group. I, I, I just really like this notion that we're doing something specific during the group and immediately afterwards that is going to then transition us and springboard us into independent study. Just that idea that when the study group is over, that doesn't mean it's all it's all wrapped up and tied off with a bow. Like there is more to come. Yes. So because, you know, I think a lot of people talk about the the struggle of transition, transitioning from, I don't know, getting home and starting studying or taking a yes. break and starting studying again. And this idea of like, what can we do to to to, to cut out that transition time? Like if I want to watch a show on Netflix, I mean, I should be able to do that. I should stop it when I'm done. But I don't want to take 30 minutes of just blah inefficiency right. to transition out of watching that show to getting t truly engaged with the study i mean that's 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 junk food time that's wasted time or if i'm coming back from a, a, a walk or a hike like how long does it take me to get done and set to actually get started so this idea of transition from study group into study active engaged study on on point independent study I think this idea of like having this agenda offload that I can then check and say, this is where I'm going to start. This is where I'm going to go. Fantastic. It's great. It's a great insight. All right. So the next one is actually not from the Brandt article, but from a cooperative learning article from the Journal of Student Centered, Stent, Student -Centered Learning. Um, it was <laughs> authored by um, the primary author on that was one of uh, one of my favorite uh, figureheads in this uh, in the area of learning, uh, Barbara Oakley. Um, she is a uh, engineering professor uh, in a at a uh, institution in Michigan. I'm trying to remember specifically what it is. I can't remember off the top of my head, but she's uh, written a book uh, called A Mind for Numbers and uh, also uh, created a, um, a massive online open course, a MOOC on Coursera called Learning How to Learn, which has been wildly popular. But in this article, um, she writes uh, the articles entitled Turning Student Groups into Effective Teams. And one of the things that one of the pieces of advice she gives in there is to beware of what she calls hitchhikers and couch potatoes. OK, mm -hmm. I know you've got your your cannon fodder and your ringleader. Um, well, she, right. she's got some pretty cre creative names for some of the people that Those can bring good. That down. Yeah. So um, Oakley, and I'm going to quote her on this, says that hitchhikers are group members that do not respect group norms, do not show mm. up for meetings or are chronically late may do substandard work, complain about all the work that they must do, and do not accept constructive feedback about their performance. Wow. Um, hitchhikers can be manipulative and usually are out for their own self-interest. Okay, so think it's about real. that. Yeah, and then couch potatoes, she said. Um, she says that they share some characteristics with hitchhikers but are a little bit different. Um, couch potatoes, as the name implies, are people that mainly – they just don't pull their own weight. OK, yeah. they're they're less toxic and manipulator manipulative than hitchhikers. Um, and but they just they're they're just not doing the work that you need them to do in the study group. They're not contributing to the same level that everybody else is. And these these two types of characters um, can really bring down uh, the productivity of a group, yeah. whether you're working in, you know, team based learning environment in the classroom or whether you're in a study group outside. I think those same types of personalities can find their ways in the group. So if you if you have someone like that in your group, get rid of them. If you yeah. are that person in the group, shape up and change your behavior so that you can you know, <laughs> so that you could stay in your group. 
Well, I guess, and I guess for me, you know, those those probably fall under the chaos agent uh, monster. Right. Yes. But for me, I, I wonder sometimes if our cannon fodders, like they just start, it's due to misalignment that they might appear to be a couch potato, or maybe. I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to exonerate the couch potato or the, uh, especially the the hitchhiker, right? But right. maybe some people slide into those slots because of the mismatch. Yes. The mismatch. Yes. So yes, we exactly. gotta, I'm inclined to be like, and I don't know, I can be a pretty harsh judge of people. So I don't know why I'm being so like flex. <laughs> like, <laughs> maybe, like I'm like, I'm like, Hey, 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 yeah. The, kids, the couch potato might just be under misunderstood or, uh, you know, they might be just be misaligned with the group. So I think it could come from two directions, right? It might just be that they're a bad fit and they need to shape, shape up or ship out. Or it might be somebody who's trying to shape up and ship out, shape up, and they yeah. can't because of all the aforementioned misalignment issues that we talked about at the beginning of our conversation. Absolutely, um, I, I agree hundred so yeah, percent. Interesting, yeah. but it's it's important to add. I, I really like all these ways to, to to assess the group dynamic and really step back and say where is this thing working? Because at the at the end of the day, if it, it, it maybe you can make modifications to make the group work, but if not, then you know, you got to, you got to look elsewhere. What, what else do you have on, on your thoughts on this? Um, so there's one, there's one more major um, kind of general strategy uh, that I wanted to mention is, and uh, again, this comes from Bryant's article. We're back to that. And he recommends doing a meeting audit. Uh, so, mm. you know, the CEOs will do a meeting audit to kind of find out what worked and what doesn't. And I think that's a great strategy for study groups. So, mm -hmm. you know, taking the time, let's say you've got a study group that you're meeting with all semester long, you know, maybe okay. at the, Maybe at the midterm, it, you know, you could take one of your sessions, you know, half an hour and, and do kind of a review or evaluation of the effectiveness of your study group. So, I, you know, I, asking I, I people love, what they think, yeah, what are, what are the strengths of this group? What do we really like? Where do we feel like we could improve as a group of learners? What are our weaknesses? Um, and then, you know, was there a learning activity that we do that we like and we find to be helpful? And maybe what are some activities that we engage in that maybe aren't so helpful? So, um, I think that that can be very powerful and really help make study groups much more effective. I bet you people love the idea, but hate the actual. Oh, doing yes. of. <laughs> I would, I would almost want to say, okay, when we we're setting up the group in January or whatever it is, put it on the calendar for March 15th or whatever. And that's when it's ha like, in other words, schedule yeah. it from, from schedule a ways yeah. out. And then it's like, we know it's coming and we're right. going to do it. Uh, I, I can see all kinds. I mean, look, like, but it, this isn't always about what's easy. This is about this. This stuff matters. Like, like yeah. studying matters. The time again is is so limited, and, I, and you know, you and I see these people and they're the suffering and the fear and and failure. I mean, failure is is a thing that happens, and we want to offset that, or you know, or maybe the fear of failure is is is, is very bad and unhealthy, and they're not going to fail, but the fear of it. So if we can ease that. I mean, these are not necessarily easy answers, but, it, no. but again, this isn't this isn't about being an office drone. This is about right. being the, the the entrepreneur. And look, being an entrepreneur, it it, it it's not always easy. It's not no. always easy. It's work. It's self reflection. It's self monitoring. It's 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 having these personal meetings with yourself or with the team. Yep. And and yeah, that's something David coined was the, the was the weekly business meeting. So like on Sunday, we have our students have a meeting with themselves where they sort of evaluate their schedule from the previous week and their study agenda from the previous week, 30 minutes, you know, yep. what did, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? Okay. Cause like the idea would be, you're making your plan for the, the following week. And if you do that every week for a month, six weeks, you know, four, six weeks down the line, oh, yeah. you are going to be better off. Is it easy? Is it fun? Do we like looking at our behaviors and our inefficiencies? No. no. None of us do. But again, if I'm just saying, oh, I want to lose five pounds because that's fun. Well, then maybe you're not that motivated to do it. But if it's like you have a heart problem and, you know, the doctor's like, if you don't do this, is you're, you're going to die. Well, that's different. Right. Or for me, like I'm a, I'm a person Absolutely. with a really bad. I'm a person with a thrice surgically repaired back. Um, my motivation yeah. to, to sort of keep my core strong and exercise is not just because, Hey, I want to be fit, which is a great motivation, but fear of spinal pain. fusion and right. pain. Yeah. Different. 
mobility. I can speak yeah. to that. I can speak to that, right? So, Absolutely. you know, we, we need we need to think about this and, and study. And I think this is a really really fascinating conversation here, where it, it's we're, we're, yeah we're talking about problems with the study groups, but I mean the heart of this conversation has been really about how you can set up and really maximize study groups. Thanks for tuning in to the StatMed podcast and be sure to look for part three of this conversation. If you like the show, we hope you'll subscribe. You can find more test taking and studying strategies specifically developed for med students and physicians over at our blog on statmedlearning.com. Thanks for listening.